I'm Allison Kenodi, and today I'm going to talk about the impacts of climate change on some of the insects in our forests. I'm going to start by focusing on brown tail moth. This uh, caterpillar here is a example of a brown tail moth larva that has been infected with Entomophaga alicae, which is a disease organism um, related, whose uh, intensity is related to weather patterns. I'm going to start off by giving a little bit of background about brown tail moth. Brown tail moth is a native of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. It was introduced into North America in the late 1800s at about the same time and in about the same area as gypsy moth. Uh, was brought into the country. Um, it spread from that area uh, to encompass parts of New England, New York, and the Maritimes of Canada, reaching its greatest extent in the early 19 teens. Shortly thereafter, the populations collapsed and they collapsed pretty rapidly. This map was, comes from the PhD dissertation of Paul Schaefer out of the University of Maine in Orono. And by the time he was doing his work, brown tail moth was found in the islands around Casco Bay in Maine and in parts of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Currently, reproducing populations are only known in Maine and Massachusetts. Um, there have been moths detected in areas outside of those two states in places like Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Brown tail moth populations began a fairly rapid expansion again in um, the late 1900s and early 2000s. And we're currently in a outbreak of this insect. We've recently found webs as far north as Fort Fairfield in northern Aroostook County and in western Ox Oxford County in the town of Bethel. So the footprint of the moth in Maine, its distribution is similar to what it was at the peak of its distribution in the early 1900s. Brown tail moth has a wide host range, including many broadleaf trees and shrubs. In Maine, it is most frequently encountered on rose family hosts, such as apples, cherries, service berries, hawthorns, and others, and also on oaks, including both red and white oak groups. It can also survive really well on other hardwood trees and shrubs. For instance, we find it fairly frequently on white and gray birch and also on elm species. The primary problem with brown tail moth is that even at low populations, it can cause human health and quality of life impacts. Encounters with the caterpillar's hairs can cause a painful, itchy rash in some people, and when inhaled, the hairs can cause respiratory distress. Brown tail moth becomes a forest health issue when there are persistent high density populations or other stressors, and that can lead to both branch dieback and tree mortality. To understand how climate impacts brown tail moth, we need to understand the life cycle. And I'm gonna cover the climate impacts on these two periods of larval feeding in early spring and in late summer. But getting back to the life cycle, there's only one generation a year. Right now they're in overwintering webs. These are the hibernacula of the caterpillars. The webs are made out of tightly woven, multi-layered silk inside. There's frass, there's uh, cast skins of caterpillars and caterpillars themselves, as well as the leaves that were fed upon in the late summer and early fall. Caterpillars will exit these webs as the weather begins to warm, usually in mid-April in Maine. And early on, they spend a lot of time hanging out on top of the webs um, on the host trees. They will go out and look for food on nice days and um, they will bore into buds at some times if the, if the uh, tree phenology isn't um, 
caught up to their phenology. At other times, um, they are able to survive for quite some time without feeding. As the leaves begin to expand, the brown tail moth is there. It's ready to eat. Um, they feed communally up until usually mid to late May in Maine. And then as the later instar caterpillars like this one down here, they will go and feed in um, singles and individually wandering more at this time. At this time, they also have um, developed their toxic hairs, which are hollow hairs that contain a poison, as well as um, they have barbs as well that can cause a physical irritation to the skin. Those hairs are not only on the caterpillars, but on the cast skin of previous instars. Caterpillars feed through the end of June. They will pupate in late June or early July, either singly or in masses. This is a communal cocoon of brown tail moth on an oak tree. Um, we also see them frequently on buildings, and a lot of times people will encounter the hairs in these cocoons from the last um, cast skin of the caterpillars. The adults emerge from the pupae in usually beginning in early July and ending in early August with a peak in mid-July. They mate and uh, the females will lay eggs on the undersides of host trees, preferentially on trees that were not defoliated in that late spring period. This uh, female here shows, um, I'm sorry, this male here shows very well what the, um, why the brown tail moth got its name. You can see the dark brown abdomen of this insect. The eggs will hatch in early August and then the caterpillars will feed communally on um, the leaf on which the eggs were deposited, as well as other leaves on that same branch of the tree. As they feed, they lay down silken strands. Those strands will tie the winter web to the host, and they also um, produce a large amount of silk, creating a protected location for them to spend their time when they are not feeding. Um, that same silk becomes incorporated into the overwintering web. So at, just after they hatch, they, they really start to build their home for the winter. So looking at that first larval feeding period, spring precip precipitation is an important factor um, that will drive population declines in Maine. And that's because one of the primary disease agents is a fungal disease called Entomophaga alicae. This disease has a broad insect host range, um, but it's not clear whether that broad range is um, from a single species or a complex of strains. Um, usually the Entomophaga are, are more um, targeted on the species that they will actually infect. It is a fungus, and as you might expect, high humidity will promote spore discharge and activity of the fungus. So in wetter weather, you get more infections. Um, those infections are promoted both by the activity of the fungus, but also the behavior of the caterpillars. The caterpillars will tend to huddle together during wetter periods, and that promotes disease transmission, both of a fungal, that fungal disease, but also of a viral disease. So if we look at that on the flip side, drier springs are going to suppress infection. And so these disease agents can actually play a big role in the population dynamics of this insect. I'm going to take a little side trip from talking about spring precipitation and look at a really important period in brown tail moth life cycle, the late summer precipitation. I mean, late summer temperature. So remember that brown tail moth is feeding as an early uh, instar larvae in um, late August and early September after they hatch out of their eggs. They can overwinter successfully at a variety of instars. And so in recent work in Maine, about 80% of the overwintering caterpillars were in second instar stage. 
but they could be in third and um, even later stages. The hypothesis is that with warmer late summer temperatures, you will get more robust caterpillars entering into winter and that will allow better overwintering survival. Um, there are problems with this faster development. Um, one is you have potential for earlier buildup of the toxic hairs in the environment in the spring when the caterpillars begin feeding. And another is related to management options for the pest. Many of the uh, biorational pesticides, such as Bt, tebufenicide, and spinosad, work best on the earlier instar caterpillars. And if you have caterpillars, more mature caterpillars leaving the winter webs, you have a much shorter window where you have both leaf expansion and early instar caterpillars. And both of those are important for those biorational pesticides because the caterpillars have to consume them in order for them to be effective. So the good news is that some formal work has been done on climate impacts to brown tail moth out of the University of Maine by master's student Carla Boyd, her advisor Ellie, Ellie Grodin, along with Frank Drummond and Charlene Donahue. These next slides come from their work. Um, they conducted an analysis of um, defoliation along with weather variables on five phenologically important periods for brown tail moth. This figure here shows summer defoliation by brown tail moth in Maine from 1994 through 2018. It's uh, data from aerial surveys conducted by the Maine Forest Service from fixed wing aircraft. The climate data that were anal analyzed came out of the Portland jet port, um, which had the longest um, climate record for the area of interest and is also located near the center of where brown, from which brown tail moth spread in Maine after the collapse in the late in the 1920s. This just so shows a summary of data from, from that site. On the top graph, you can see total precipitation in May and June out of Portland, Maine. And you can see that there's no real uh, trend in that data. On the bottom is the 10-year average temperature by decade in August and September. And you can see an upward trend in this data. These data were analyzed on an annual basis, the temperature data, and they did show a significant upward trend. This graph shows brown tail moth summer defoliation as a function of average temperature and precipitation. So summer defoliation was negative, negatively related to precipitation in, the, in uh, May and June, and it was positively related to temperatures in August and September. So in summary, the diseases that are important in suppressing brown tail moth populations are dependent on spring rains. And the small larvae that are developing to go into the winter are their survival the following year is dependent on the late summer temperatures. So what does that mean from, for the outlook um, of climate change? This, these data here come from the New England and Northern New York Forest Ecosystem Vulnerability Assessment and Synthesis document out of the U.S. Forest Service General Technical Report, NRS 173. And you can see here that the models do not agree on the trends for future spring precipitation. Um, in this scenario, in most years, you would expect spring precipitation to, to be able to 
help suppress brown tail moth populations, having more precipitation. In this scenario, you would expect to have um, less impact of spring precipitation on brown tail moth populations. The real news about this is that what may be more important than the averages predicted is going to be the extremes, either very dry conditions or very wet conditions, because those will impact um, most how the diseases develop. As far as late summer temperature, the models are in agreement regarding temperature chains. It's going to be an upward trend, and that's going to favor um, more rapid development of those overwintering larvae and we should expect more defoliation, which means higher populations of brown tail moth. So in summary, spring moisture is important in promoting population control, the diseases of brown tail moth. Spring dryness, on the other hand, leads to better caterpillar survival. Warmer late summer temperatures will promote more rapid development of the overwintering larvae and you have more robust caterpillars going into the winter and probably better overwinter survival. In periods when there are increased populations or if our populations are hitting a broader area, you're going to have the quality of life impacted over a much broader geographic footprint. This can be pretty severe in some cases, the impacts to quality of life. We can also expect more tree and forest damage with sustained outbreaks. Much of the story of entomophaga and spring precipitation in brown tail moth will hold true for gypsy moth. I've included a handout with some background information from the recent outbreak in southern New England and urged you to look at that handout for some background on that most recent outbreak. I'm going to shift gears and talk about low winter temperatures and southern pine beetle. Southern pine beetle has not been found in Maine at this point. We have been trapping for it since 2016 at a small number of sites with help from a number of cooperators. It is a well-known economic forest pest in the southeastern U.S. and it is native to the southern North America and South America. Southern pine beetle is experiencing a range expansion in the east with northern records of both outbreak populations and beetle captures being set in recent years. In 2001, the, there was noted an outbreak of southern pine beetle in southern New Jersey and there were several years of defoliation all the way up through 2014 or impact from this pest up to 2014. And um, then in 2014, the insect was found causing damage in Long Island, New York, and in later years in other portions of Southern New York. This slide from Matt Ayer out of Dartmouth illustrates how winter temperature extremes impact Southern pine beetle with Southern pine beetle mortality occurring at these temperatures below negative 20 C um, for 90% of the population. And also that those extreme low winter temperatures were not occurring in New Jersey prior to the outbreak detection in 2001. Subsequent to those outbreak detections, other states began monitoring for southern pine beetle. And in 2015, there were detections in Connecticut and Massachusetts. There was later detection of tree damage in Connecticut. In 2016, there were detections of southern pine beetle in Rhode Island and additional detections in Connecticut and Massachusetts and in New York as well with a detection not on this map in 2017 in the Albany pine bush in New York. In Maine to date, we have not captured any southern pine beetle in our traps.
This model from Lesk et al. predicts parts of Maine are already vulnerable to southern pine beetle establishment. Southern pine beetle is just one dendroctinus of concern. We have native dendroctinus on spruce and larch that can become more problematic as their development responds to a warming climate, and they also have better overwintering survival. There's more information on southern pine beetle found in the resources provided on the FCCI website. That's all I have for this pre-recorded session, and I look forward to talking to you all next week. Thank you.